uh, yeah, thanks guys for coming down. Thanks guys for coming down. Uh, I don't know, we, I contacted you last year if they couldn't do a concert. We've just been trying to figure it out because getting everybody in the room together is not that easy. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much for your patience. And, uh, it's great to have Brian who built all of these. I suppose you should get on with talking because you're going to explain it way better than I'm ever going to do it. So. <laughs> So thanks, yeah. thanks, Owen. Uh, uh, so maybe I'll just start. I'll just, I have three uh, things here to pass around that people can leave through. Uh, first one, uh, tuning timbre spectrum scale by William Sartaris. Maybe I don't know who has heard of who's read or knows about that book. Not not many. That's great. It's good. I'm glad to be the one to uh, introduce you. What's that? Oh, oh, you reviewed it. Okay. Uh, so, well, maybe I'll pass it to uh, people. Um, so, actually, Wayne Vitali uh, introduced me to that book maybe three years ago. And since then, that, this is kind of the product of that moment of Wayne handing me that book. Um, and then this is a, just another uh, great publication on acoustics by Chris Forrester, who's in San Francisco. Um, so I can pass it. And then this is a thing that I wrote about these instruments and it kind of sums up the presentation. So feel free to leaf through these. Um, so to start from the point of um, why did Sitharis' book, what does that have to do with all of this? Um, so I guess I should start by saying it, this is kind of an exploration into timbre in a way that I think a lot of uh, new music um, it's become sort of a new field. It seems like one of the few fields of acoustics that is still growing in a really compelling and interesting way. Um, so to sum it up, uh, Sotharis, the premise of his theory on music is that um, scales as we know it and their formation and their evolution over time comes out of like a generative or, or, or an organic process that draws from the timbre of the instruments playing those scales. So um, how do you get the harmonic scale, right? His, his philosophy behind how the, harmon the, uh, the diatonic scale is generated is because it comes from instru instruments that have harmonic resonance. So if you look at the overtone series, the spectrum of uh, a vibrating string, you're going to see a series of integers and they're all going to hit natural harmonics, right? Probably most of the people in this room know about that. Um, so therefore, you know, that's the sound of the fifth harmonic has this nice major third quality. And whether or not we're playing scales with major thirds, we're going to hear that over and over again every time we hear a string vibrating. So uh, over time, he says that you're going to have scales that prioritize fifths and that prioritize thirds. Maybe not quite so much sevenths, the seventh harmonic. But you know, a lot of Indian music has that. Um, and, uh, and certainly, I mean, if you look at temperament over the ages, it's all about, been about uh, a push and pull between whether or not to prioritize the thirds or the fifths. Um, okay, so that's harmonic instruments. Uh, an instrument like this does not function uh, using that same system. Um, because when, when I play this key, and if you analyze the spectrum, you're not going to see anything that represents a harmonic like you would see in a stringed instrument or a wind instrument. Uh, instead, what you have is a series of overtones that correspond to different vibrational modes uh, that are naturally occurring in the key. So there's different series uh, of modes, uh, the most prominent being the, what are called the, the transverse modes. So uh, what we would refer to as the fundamental mode of vibration in this would also be called the first transverse mode. Um, Actually, let me, I'm going to skip forward. I'll come back to this, but I'll skip forward. Um, so you can see this is a little badly depicted drawing of various modes. Um, so this is what the, the, so the transverse modes, right, they're occurring across the length of the key. Um, now, what's interesting is the second transverse mode, which would be the, the, the first most prominent overtone, uh, has in an ideal key a frequency ratio of 2.7 to 1. So as opposed to the, the, first, uh, the second harmonic, right, which is 2 to 1, or the third harmonic, 3 to 1, here you have this 
uh, irrational number uh, it, it relationship between the, the two frequencies. Um, so then going forward, in, I see Keenan's making a face. That means I probably said something wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Feel free to jump in though. If, uh, if, if, uh, uh, in any case, so that so um, th these calculations are from Sitaris's book on, on ideal bars. So the, the so then the, the second transverse mode would be 2.7 to the frequency of the first, the third 5.4, and the fourth 8.9. Um, so uh, now let me let me. Well, I'm gonna uh, okay. Let me let me play um, let me play that for you. <laughs> so when you hear this key, right? um, now I, I don't know how much your ear can pick up on on the spectrum. Uh, obviously, the first the, the, the fundamental is, is very prominent, but also very prominent is the first torsional one. So the way that the scale on this instrument uh, is designed is I've tuned the fundamental uh, uh, mode, so the, the, the first transverse mode, of higher pitch keys to the torsional mode of these lower keys. So does that make sense? And, and what you get is a scale that doesn't resemble just intonation in any way, shape, or form. It's, it's extracted from this highly inharmonic sound world that these instruments have embedded in them. Um, so, yeah, essentially, um, without getting too into it, I'll, I'll show some of the charts later, but the five pitches are extracted from, so this is the, the pitch one, or the, the generative key, gives me the fifth pitch of the scale. This is tuned to a, a certain octave equivalency that gives you the fourth pitch. Um, now, this, this key, the tuned an octave low, doesn't give me a pitch that I want in, my, in this scale. So I then had to find a second generative key, which became to be this one, and that gives me the third. So with this key and, and this key, just based on their, the rough tuning timbre that they have from the, the original building process, I was able to create the, the other three pitches of the scale. Um, th th any questions at this point? Or? Okay, good. Um, so let me go back. Uh, and if you don't mind, I'm going to kind of flip back and forth between talking about what, what I'll call the, the intra-instrument relationship would be this, the, the tuning the instrument to itself, and the inter-instrument relationship, which is how they're tuned with respect to one another. So to go to uh, kind of the big picture of the, the inter-relationship, uh, this chart represents all of the, the beating relationships across um, unison or semi-equivalent uh, frequencies uh, in, in adjacent keys. Um, so, uh, I, and it's the, I don't know if you know, the chart's uh, drawn a little bit strangely because you'll notice that the right side of the chart up to this bottom line is all defined in cent values. And then everything above that is, is uh, hertz deviations from the cent values. And the reason why I made that chart like that, and this is kind of an interesting um, uh, phenomena of this sound world, is that this is really one of the only instances in music where linear space uh, is a determining factor in the tuning and the way that we perceive the music, as opposed to logarithmic space, like how we hear at intervals. Um, so, you know, we'll, we'll hear, Maybe, can I ask at this point, uh, maybe Wayne, could you come up for a second? So, uh, let's see, let's, let's play the, uh, the, the, the F for that. Maybe you can hear it's it's, it's about it's separated by about seven hertz, so it's seven beats per second. I don't know how well you can hear that. Now, when I play on, on these instruments, you 
hear about the same rate of beating, right? Now, let, let me show you another, another uh, instance. So here's the, the lowest. function acoustically, it could be that you're sitting in a place where it's really prominent or it's not. But um, to me, th there's something phenomenal about what just happened, which is that intervallically, the distance from, from this key to that key is, is much smaller than the, dis the intervallic distance from the two keys that are seven hertz apart in the lower register. And yet when you play them together, it sounds, it sounds like it's the same distance, right? So that, that's what I'm trying to say by Linear, linear space becoming a determining factor in how we perceive the music. Um, because when your ear hears these beating relationships, uh, it, it, you, uh, the resident acousticians feel free to jump in and correct me if I'm wrong. But, <laughs> but uh, my understanding is that you average out the frequency of, of the two pitches. So if this is, uh, say, 1,000 hertz and that's 1,007, if I were to try to define that frequency, I, I, you know, 99 out of 100, I'm going to get close, I'm going to zero in on 103.7 hertz. Um, so, um, so in any case, this chart shows you all of the beating relationships across all, of, all six of these metal instruments. Um, and it, what's um, unique about this model is that, in, in, so this is extracted from a tuning model uh, that's used by the Balinese in Balinese music. They call that beating uh, phenomena ombak. Um, and for the most part, in, in every gamelan, the, those beating relationships are, are tuned to, to be held constant across all registers of the gamelan. And uh, by, Wayne is one of the world's experts in, in Balinese tuning. Um, and the, the model that he uses, correct me if I'm wrong, but it keeps the higher pitched instruments at true octaves across all registers, and then keeps the same rate of beating to the lower pitch instruments. Therefore, you create a natural, uh, kind of a natural octave stretching because, you know, if you imagine the intervallic distance gets gets larger as you as the hertz stay the same in the lower registers. Um, but with this model, I thought it would be much more interesting to have a rate of beating that that varied across uh, uh, equidistant keys on the on, on instruments. Um, so maybe we can just. Play, why don't we just play for them the scale, the full scale on this instrument? Yeah. Tuned as a palindrome, right? So that the at the wide, the, the outmost extremes of the instrument, you hear the fastest rate of beating, and in the middle, you, it's held constant. Uh, and this comes a little bit from um, a, another gamelan group in Bali called Gamelan Salukat, which is run by a composer Dewa Alit, and uh, he tuned his gamelan to something similar. He didn't um, he didn't exactly have a variation um, within one instrument to the next. But he took instances where you would have four uh, identical instruments and tune them so that they're all slightly apart from one another, as opposed to two pairs that are that are tuned just with one one frequency space. Um, so I'll just play you. Uh, maybe I won't go through the whole thing, but I'll, I'll play you what. Uh, maybe I'll jump through uh, 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 what what the what the that all these beating relationships sound through the whole ensemble. Is there a way to get a little more volume?
I'm going to stop it there. Um, so um, what I like about this type of tuning model is you're able to get very uh, complex um, depths of sound just with using one note. Uh, one note, you might say. Um, and so anytime we have uh, just unison pitches on, across different registers of the instruments, we can get a lot of different varieties in those beating relationships, uh, which kind of pulls your ear into this micro perception. Um, so this is, a, again, that's just the chart representing these two instruments. And then, uh, OK, back to here. So uh, one thing, I don't know if, it, so I was mentioning those frequency relationships. Uh, part of the reason, and you can see, that's why I wanted to show both of these charts, is you can see how the, the nodes and the anti-nodes are moving outwards with respect to the, the full length of the bar, right? So if it were, notice how these, these curved lines that are drawn showing where, they, where the nodes are in the vibrational modes. Um, and it, it's those relationships that give these uh, irrational frequency values, uh, or in interval values. Um, so um, this is from that, that big hefty book that Owen has. Um, this is Chris Forrester's uh, depiction of how to tune um, very, uh, specific vibrational modes in, in a keyed instrument. Um, so uh, essentially what he's saying is at the midpoint, and if you, if you remove material from the midpoint, the, the two vibrational modes that you're going to most affect are the first and the third transverse. Um, the, then if you remove from these two points, you're going to affect more heavily the second and the first, and then the further out you go, you're affecting the third and the second. Um, so why is this important? Um, if you look at, say, a, a marimba one, I don't know if you guys are familiar with that company, but they make uh, concert marimbas that are uh, based in Eureka, probably the top marimbas being made nowadays. Um, the lowest keys on a marimba one are maybe quadruple or five, time, five tune modes out of Gino Keenan? At least triple. I think they're quadruple. I think they're quadruple, which is to say that when you play one key, um, you have obviously the fundamental mode of vibration tuned. But then you'll have probably the second and the third transverse, and then maybe the lateral as well, or even probably not the torsional. But um, and that's a very very difficult thing to do, because as you can see briefly by this drawing, anything that you do to remove material from any part of the key is going to affect all of the modes, but it, they'll affect them at a different rate. So um, there. In other words, there's a lot of ways to screw it up. <laughs> um, so let, let me show you on these marimbas. Um, that I'll, I'll give you a demonstration of that of, mo of how those modes are tuned. Um, so the, the, these are the, the what I call the baritone marimbas. Uh, these have two tuned modes. So the fundamental and then two octaves above, roughly, um, but tuned to some equivalent where that pitch occurs. Uh, on these instruments. Then in the higher octave, two octaves and a fourth. So um, when you play the instruments just normally on the, on the center of the key, transverse mode. Um, and so again, this is ways to really get into the depth of the timbre of the instrument, uh, things that are kind of like the unseen qualities behind the sound. Um, now the bass, the bass marimbas are, are triple tuned. Um, so you have your, your low fundamental. Then the second transverse. Transverse is the one that you're probably hearing more prominently now. 
gives another five tone scale. And you know, obviously, depending on what type of mallet you use, you extract different. Um, so again, um, the reason why I'm, I, I, I find this type of sound world to be interesting is this music, you're, you know, oftentimes you're limited to five or sometimes seven tones. And I think a lot of the tendency in, in Western music and Western composers is to, to stop the discussion there. Say, oh, this is five tone music, this is seven tone music. But really it's a whole lot more than that because these considerations of timbre have a lot to do with how you might perceive these sounds in a way that's very different than in harmonic instruments. So, uh, and that's why, you know, I, I don't know how many times you would have heard instances of, of uh, Indonesian music translated for Western instruments. There's always, almost always some level of depth that, that's never there uh, because of the timbral qualities that are built into these instruments. So again, um, here you have the, the intra relationship of the, the, the various vibrational modes. And then another, I don't know if you're gonna be able to hear this, but the beating relation, the interrelationship of the beating. So So again, it's this is tuned very wide on the on the highest keys and, and very narrow distance in the lower keys. Okay. Moving right along. Feel free to ask me any questions at, at any point. Um, so um, this chart uh, shows what I was uh, trying to describe before. So uh, this would be uh, this key gives that pitch, and then. Oh, so, yeah. So here's another thing that's a little bit um, unique about the function of this type of instrument. Um, so if, if any of you are familiar with piano tuning, um, you'll know that almost all pianos are tuned with some level of octave stretching. And there are a variety of reasons why that, uh, why that is done. And maybe we can you know, have a little conversation about, about it uh, at the end of this. I'd be interested to hear what people think. Um, but commonly, one of the reasons is obviously because of some natural inharmonicity in the, in the piano. So when you have these uh, really low wound strings that are uh, thick, you'll, you'll get levels of inharmonicity that don't correspond to the natural harmonic spectra of what the, what the string should be. Uh, similarly, on the very high octave, because of how tightly uh, strung the strings are, you get other amounts of inharmonicity. And so one of the ways to adjust to what might come out as sounding like beats, even in true octaves, is to stress the octaves. Uh, another reason is uh, just naturally, uh, there's, there's some cognitive psychoacoustic reason why we hear slightly stretched octaves as more consonant than true octaves. I don't know if maybe somebody knows more about that than, than I do in here, but um, in any case. Um, so uh, in these instruments, because there's no harmonic spectra, it, it doesn't matter if the octaves aren't true octaves because it, unlike on two stringed instruments that are tuned an octave apart, if they're slightly uh, misaligned in, from the, the true octave, you're gonna have a, an entire spectra of overtones that are clashing with each other, that are just apart, and so they're creating all of these different levels of beats. And you know, if you look at Helmholtz's drawings from you know, uh, the, the 19th century, he, he shows you a dissonance curve that essentially describes you know, the, those points of the most roughness in how the, when, when you get the closest to two harmonic pitches, um, all of the roughness of the beats that occur, right? Um, but in, in this sound world, you, you don't have harmonic spectra. So if you have two things that are, say, a fifth apart, but not quite a fifth, uh, it's, you're not gonna hear them being really out of tune because you're not gonna have that clash of overtones. So, uh, and, and same thing with the octaves. So you can, you can get away with a whole lot of, of stretching of intervals. Um, so here's um, a chart that shows essentially, for, this is just describing the metal instruments. Um, the, the octave stretching, so this, is, this would be the true octave. So from the, the, lower, the lowest register up to the first octaves, 
the, the, the octaves are, are squeezed, actually, they're narrow. And then going up to the very highest octaves, they're stretched. So I'll play you what uh, that sounds like. short again but uh, I don't know how, how um, clear it was but to my ear the, the moment where it, where it starts to jump to wide octaves uh, it's I mean it's audible all the beating relationships but it does it's not so obvious that okay now we're going from squeezed octaves to stretched octaves uh, as it would be if you were playing all of these same frequency values on a, on a piano for example um, Okay, so uh, just showing you this, going back to this chart, um, I'm gonna kind of move into talking a little bit about uh, 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 com some of the composed music for these instruments. So um, for me, um, getting into really thinking about all of these uh, tuning relationships and the sort of symmetry of these beating relationships uh, kind of also translated into thinking about like a, a larger scale form for compositional ideas. Um, so the first piece that we ever played together on these instruments is a piece that I wrote called Prana. And in that piece, I decided to extract um, some of these values of these beating clusters and, and apply them to large scale cycles in the music. So um, the, the gong cycles in the piece uh, go from the, the widest 25 down to the smallest nine. Um, and you might see that these numbers correspond to, so starting at 21, 19, 15, 11, 9, you'll see those beating clusters, 21, 19, 15, 11, 9. So uh, what I did with that piece was to say, okay, the piece starts with uh, kind of a very sparse soundscape and the group kind of keeps an internal time. Um, and then the first section is based on 21 beat long cycles and it's based around that third pitch of the scale. So that becomes essentially the, the tonic um, tone for that section. And then moves uh, inward in, in terms of the cluster values all the way to the middle of the piece or the apex is uh, based on pitch one. Um, and it's nine beat long cycles. Similarly, the, um, the form uh, then reverts as a palindrome. So all of the, all of the intersections I should say that the intro relationships of the sections are all mini palindromes, so that the, the whole piece, the, the intro relationship of the piece, is one macro palindrome. Um, and, uh, and that, again, comes from this idea of these palindromic beating relationships across unison instruments. Um, now, another thing um, that, uh, that I use a lot in terms of uh, ry rhythmic composing is a uh, moment of symmetry operations. And uh, I don't know if uh, people know the work of Irv Wilson at all. Um, he's a, <coughs> another tuning theorist. Um, so he published about moment of symmetry operations. I'm sure maybe some of these charts might look familiar to you under a different name. Um, but essentially, it's you know, t taking, taking certain units um, uh, 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 or certain sets and dividing them by, by equivalent unit sizes. And the, t the, 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 moment of, the moments of symmetry are when you get to only two different sizes of the pies, you might say. So all these ones that are grayed up, if you look, you'll see that, so for example, this one, the two sizes are twos and threes, right? So two, two, three, two, three. Uh, all of the other ones are not symmetrically divided in that way. So uh, how do you translate this to a rhythm? Right, so let's take um, um, this one, right? 
Um, so let's maybe if we start here. So. Sounds a lot like Steve Wright, right? No. Um, so there's something uh, unique about this particular moment of symmetry too, in that it's th it's the same um, it's it, it's the same divisions of the the diatonic scale. Right? Long, long, short, long, short. Um, whole step, whole step, half step, whole step, whole step. Um, so uh, in in the piece that I was describing earlier, prana. Um, I applied a moment of symmetry operation to an 11 unit set and then turned, a, turned it into kind of a symmetrical rhythm. So um, this one would start from counting on seven. So uh, and all that happens is the two lines have uh, uh, some of these notes, these, these rhythms filled in. So. The, the top line, the A minus. Uh. Um, and uh, I'm able to also create an easy symmetry in, in the rhythm by simply taking the top line, uh, which, which has its own retrograde written into it, and then uh, do, applying the reverse uh, operation to the uh, same line occurring simultaneously. Um, uh, so that, that idea, to some extent, is also pulled from uh, the, the same Balinese composer that I mentioned earlier, Dewa Lit. So this is a, a gong cycle taken from one of his pieces. Um, ideas, the way I think about them, is to get kind of a maximal amount of rhythmic uh, complexity using very simple techniques. So he'll, he'll maybe teach one player, okay, count four, four, three, two, and play them in these divisions, and now tell the other player, okay, just do that same thing in reverse. And what you get is this, this natural retrograde that has, that forms its own palindrome. Um, so that's from a piece of his, and this is from that same piece of mine that I was talking about. So as you can see, there's one melodic line that has a certain uh, polymetric modulation that occurs um, going in one direction and then going in the simple retrograde so that you get a natural apex and a natural palindrome. Um, so uh, moving to kind of the music, some of the music we're going to play tonight. Here's a drawing that Wayne made um, of the, the piece that we're about to perform for you. And uh, a lot of the ideas uh, are, are connected to some of these earlier pieces. So in, in this piece, we came up with this large scale form that's in 11 movements, right? And they, they uh, have, are symmetrical around the apex, which is based on like, a, a certain pitch. So uh, similar to the other piece, there's a, there's a pitch assigned to each movement as to maybe thinking about it as the, the tonic or um, more, more appropriately the, the qualities associated to that pitch in, in Balinese music or Balinese cosmology. So the, the, the first movement by our reckoning is uh, kind of similar to the, the first movement of the other piece is not associated to any pitch space. It's sort of like a free space. Then the second movement revolves around this pitch. Um, and the, in, in, in Balinese terminology, the pitch is referred to as dang, and it has qualities of supernatural, uh, has a color associated with it, which I believe is yellow. Um, it, uh, it, it has uh, you know, cer certain things that are kind of built in, culturally built into that tone. So uh, then the next movement is based on this pitch. So the color would be purple. Uh, 
the association is that it's more powerful. Um, so what we did was we created this large scale form and then started working out the details. Um, and uh, because we both were kind of experimenting with this idea of uh, how, what does it mean to co-compose a piece, because we got this commission to co-compose the piece, uh, we ended up deciding that, okay, he'll write a certain amount of movements on this side, and I'll write the rest of them. And then on the outside, on the, on the sort of symmetrical uh, decline of the piece, I rewrite the movements that he wrote here, and he rewrites the movements that I wrote. Um, so that's what you'll hear later tonight, and I think we're both really happy in that, working in that way. Um, so now just uh, one last thing, this, uh, this is probably impossible to see, but this is a chart taken from um, kind of a notation that I used to, to write one of the pieces that we're going to play tonight. And uh, maybe we'll play it for you now really quickly. Um, but um, a lot of, we all, we've also, as an ensemble, we've experimented with a lot of different types of notation because sometimes, you know, most of what we can do, we can get a little away with really easily using Western notations. But occasionally, it's not, it's not the right type of language, you know, either some sort of graphic notation or some sort of unit-based notation, kind of like a, like a Feldman idea works. So uh, this was the original no notation for this piece. And it's based off of a piece by Ben Johnston called Knocking Piece. Um, I don't, does anybody, is anyone familiar with that piece? So the piece uh, um, essentially uh, came out of a, a, a piano piece that he wrote in just intonation. And what he did was he took the, the intervallic relationship between the just intervals and then translated them into modulatory rhythms. So the, the first unit of the piece is like a three over two. And then he takes the pulse from the two and keeps it steady and has that be the three underneath a four, which is at a new tempo. And then once that new pulse is established, the tempo of the four stays steady and becomes the five underneath now a new tempo, which is the four. So it, and it, go, it kind of uh, does this, um, what's the term for it, you know, the um, kind of crisscrossing of the rhythms. And it's an insanely hard piece to play. I've, I've, never, I've never heard anybody play it well or seen any video. I've tried to play it several times and always failed miserably. And written in the instructions of how to play it, he says, one of the points he says is, you need to be really close friends with the person that you're going to play it. <laughs> Which to me is about as big of a warning that you could give before. <laughs> uh, so anyways, this is kind of taken from that same idea, but it's all drawn, drawn out into specific uh, measurable time units. Um, so you can see it starts with a, a 5 over 4 with respect to this pulse. I don't know, it's probably really hard to see from where you're sitting. Yeah. Um, and then the second, the second cell keeps the same, the same 5 beats, but then creates a, a, a new pulse of 6 underneath the, uh, the 5. And then that pulse stays while this becomes a, a new pulse, and so on and so forth. The only difference being that when we play it, we repeat each cell three times, as opposed to in Ben Johnson's piece. Everything moves along immediately. Um, so I don't know if um, the, you, James is wrong. You guys want to maybe we'll play it and then we can have some time for questions. Does that sound good? Okay. Um, and I have a, I think in one of those books there's a um, is there a little black book? Oh, here we go. Um, if anybody that that's a uh, both impossible to see and not the full score, but if you want to follow through the whole score, it's written on this uh, Thank you. 
Thanks. Um, so does anybody have any questions or things they want to talk about? <laughs> well, it, it's all a bit dense, so uh, my mind doesn't work so fast. <laughs> I understand the ideas of the basing upon the linearity of beats mm. through the pitch spaces. Mm. It's uh, an important idea. Yeah, I, I think um, I, I got into a whole. I, I, I spent a lot of time with Larry Polanski these days. I don't know if you guys know him, but yeah. we, we both live in Santa Cruz and. I'm doing a degree and down there, and he's he's on uh, the faculty, and uh, we were talking a lot about that that the linear space created by the, the the beating relationship, but it's arguable as to whether or not you could call it truly like a linear frequency space because in a way, at least this is his opinion, um, that when you hear those beats, you you it's like a it's a, like a rhythmic phenomenon almost. You know, it's not you're not hearing it. I mean that's. That's both the, the argument for and against it, right? That because you're hearing, you're not hearing it as an intervallic space because it occurs within the critical band. Yeah. Um, everybody know what, what, what the critical band is? Yeah. Okay. Um, or should I describe the critical band? Okay, <laughs> the critical band uh, is, uh, and again, resident acousticians, feel free to correct it. But um, it's the, the, the space um, by which, uh, Inside of the critical band, you hear two uh, frequencies that are very close occurring as like a, a, a modulation in amplitude. So it sounds like it sounds like a beat, like a rhythm, like a doop 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 doop. Um, and outside of which, you hear them as two different pitches, or you hear an interval. So it's it's and it has to do with a, a phenomenon within the inner ear as to what portion of hair cells that it's affecting. Um, how, to, how it, you breach the critical band. There's a great uh, composition by Jim Tenney called Critical Band, in which the first 10 minutes of it, all of it occurs within that frequency space. So it's all these complex beating relationships. And then the, the next 10 minutes is spreading out to different harmonic just intervals. Um, so in any case, without going more down <laughs> the rabbit hole, uh, I think there, there's an argument, I think there's maybe more to be said than what I could say about that, that difference in like linearity versus logarithmic pitch space and how it applies to this music. Um, any other uh, thoughts or won't be shy? Well, the, the ear seems to, to like beats. Yeah. And you certainly have lots of them. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, Keenan, did you have something to say? If you're going to start from scratch and build something like this all over again, what would you change? I would definitely um, make more less thick keys because, as it stands now, the lowest metal pitch that's the lowest pitch. It's like F3, I think, um, and it's not very low. <laughs> and it's in part because the the metal that I used was really thick. Um, whereas, you know, with, with bronze gamelons, uh, you can get really nice, really low pitch sounds that have a beautiful, powerful sustain. Um, so, yeah, I'd like to work, try to work with bronze, although it's very complicated, and to make lower pitched metal instruments. Because why did you do that? Um, well, I made all of the, the metal keyed instruments uh, in, in kind of a compressed period of time during a residency a few years ago in Washington State. And it, I mean, part of it was just the materials that were around and the time that we had to do it. Um, so typically, how, how long does it take you to make one of the uh, double For the, well, let's see, I made, well, I totally cheated in that. I, I got metal that was already made, that yeah. was already fabricated, had been forged already, and then all I did was reshape it. Yeah. Um, if you were to forge your own metal, no, 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 no. yeah, that's a whole other thing. Yeah. But I built all of these, the keys for these, in I think it was three days. Really? Yeah. And tuned um, them. What's that? And tuned them. Uh, and I rough tuned them, and then a while later went back and fine tuned them to those yeah. uh, values that I showed you, and that took about a week. 
Um, and then, but then the marimbas, the four marimbas, took about six weeks. Yeah. yeah. You, you want to play a little something that, that demonstrates the key instruments? Sure. Um, maybe we could play. Uh, I think we have enough people here that we could play the maybe the beginning of the sounding piece. Would that be okay? Yeah. Sure. Maybe you just we'll just end before the you know after the do like two millennia from here. Before I come up. Uh, just opening one move like one <laughs> Well yeah, one time I'll just like a little sample. Unfortunately, there's nobody really outside of Indonesia that I know about who's ever made bronze gamelan instruments. I mean, do you know? Here, you mean? Yeah. Not yet. <laughs> not not we, yet. We know some people who are on, kind of on the verge, who yeah. really, yeah. truly want to try and to do it, to there forge was, keys Dan and traditional stuff. Yeah, Dan, Dan Yasmin. Yasmin. But, well, he's, so there's a guy in Oakland, Daniel Yasmin, he works with this space there called the, the Crucible. Um, and uh, he started to make something like this, and he got about to maybe like stage eight of thirty, uh, and then and then it kind of broke down. But it's it's really really difficult uh, metallurgical it, practice. Has, has the uh, have people made close observations of the people, Indonesian people who make the cones? Do they uh, absolutely? Do them? Yeah, there's a, a great video that was made about 25 years ago called Copper, Tin, and Fire. And uh, it was originally, I had got it as a, as a VHS, but I think it's on the, to be, to be found in the, in the web somewhere. And it's really brilliant. It, it's, it's about simply making one of the medium-sized complete they're called. Um, and it shows the entire process. They start out with this disc of bronze that's thick in the middle. And they keep heating it up in the fire and then hammering it out. And it's, it's really fascinating. It takes 11 years. They're listening all the time? Uh, or at some later stage, they begin listening carefully? Uh, there's or no uh, tuning in the sense you mean uh, at all until they quench it. Yeah. And then they, then they hear the sound. And then they, then they uh, polish it. And then it, in the, during the polishing process, they start actually tuning it. I see. Yeah. And what do they do to tune it? They, uh, they hammer it, they cold hammer it, yeah. yeah. And uh, the, the scraping, of course, changes it, so they do, they do those two processes together. Yeah, but it's quite fascinating. Uh, 
for example, just a little vignette of the process. When they're actually forging it, you know, you put it in the fire and it gets red hot and then the smith brings it out and he holds it over an anvil and the anvil kind of comes to a point about maybe this big, but it's this huge piece of metal that goes way into the ground, it's very heavy. And then, so he holds it over, over the, um, the anvil and then there's four uh, guys hammering and they hammer successively. So it's like one, two, three, four, one, two, three. So you, if you watch it, it's yeah. this very musical, beautiful, rhythmic thing that's happening. Yeah. But part of the reason they do it so fast is that you only get about half a revolution yeah. uh, before it's too cold again, they have to put it back in the fire. So they want maximum numbers of strokes. But every, every stroke has to hit an area about like three quarters of an inch. It has to be within that accuracy. Yeah in order to do it properly. And so they start in the middle and they spiral outward uh, with these several, you know, going back in, in and out of the fire. And eventually they start forming the, the, the feet, you know, the shoulders, whatever you call it, of the, uh, of the shape. And then getting the boss, the, the knob, uh, is kind of later on in the process. And it's really amazing. Yeah. It's worth, worth watching. And, and how long does the whole tech process take? Um, 11, uh, 11 workers can create uh, one instrument in one day if they already have the bronze. In other words, if they've already combined the copper and the tin, that's a separate process. And they, and they have this, you know, they can pour this and have this disc, yeah. the starting disc. They can go to making a, a, a finished one, not yet polished, not yet tuned in a day. And then on the next day, they'll, they'll start, the, they'll scrape it and polish it and start tuning it and so forth. So, and the, the process is unchanged. It has not changed over centuries. With one exception, they have an acetylene torch nearby. And it used to be if they missed and you put a hole in it, you're hosed. You had to start over. You just had to you know, quench it, break it into pieces, throw it back in, and start all over again. But now with the acetylene torch, if it's still hot, they can, um, they can repair that one spot and hammer over it and it'll come out okay. But aside from that, it's still the same process they've been using. Where in Bali do they do it? Too? Uh, they, they do it in Tiangan, which is out in the east. But in Bali, they only have uh, the surviving technology, so to speak, is only to make the smaller ones, like say the size of that smallest one up there, and all these types of pots here that are called the uh, like rail and trompong pots. The larger gongs, it, it's in, you have to go to Java. And they, they did, there was a period, I don't know how long, 50 years maybe, 100 years, where they were making larger gongs in Bali, but it, they were so much better at it in Java that it kind of died out. And that was like maybe 30 years ago, 40 years ago, they just stopped making the large ones in Bali. But you can still go to Java and watch the whole process. Yeah. I, I didn't hear there was like a truck full of gongs every month that comes from Java to Bali. It's a crazy huge business because uh, people in Bali are, you know, I mean, Bali's the size of Rhode Island, which I like to point out because I come from Rhode Island. Anyhow, um, it has like something like 3,000 active gamelan ensembles, right? And it's a tourist destination. You get 3 million people visiting Bali every year from other countries. And many people are, like Brian and me, they get quite fascinated with this. They want to buy a gong or something. So this is unbelievably thriving trade in gamelan instruments. So the, the smiths in Java have this kind of mainline network set up with the smiths in Bali and they come over with a, a pickup truck and they'll have 30 gongs in the back and they'll go and they, they like evaporate immediately. They're immediately purchased by musicians in Bali and international visitors. So quite a, quite a scene. Any other, any other questions or anything? Right All right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah.